For many Americans, Appomattox symbolizes the end of the Civil War. On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered his Confederate forces to Union General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, signaling the end of the four-year-long American Civil War. However, it would be more than 16 months until President Andrew Johnson declared the end of the conflict in August 1866. Appomattox was certainly an essential win for the Union, and Grant's peace agreement with Lee served as an example for other generals across the country. So, why did it take so long for the war to officially end after that? The series of events that marked the end of the war began with Lee's Appomattox campaign. General Lee's last campaign began on March 25, 1865, with a Confederate attack on Fort Stedman near Petersburg. A week later, on April 1st, General Grant's soldiers launched a counterattack at Five Forks, forcing Lee to flee Richmond and Petersburg the next day. The Confederate Army's retreat continued southwest along the Richmond and Danville Railroad. Lee anxiously sought a train filled with supplies for his troops, but found none. Seeing that Lee's army was out of alternatives, Grant addressed a letter to Lee on April 7th, seeking his surrender. Grant wrote to Lee, The result of last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on the part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. Lee answered, stating that he disagreed with Grant's estimate of his army's inability to resist further. However, he was curious about the terms Grant was offering. Meanwhile, Union General Philip Sheridan's cavalry, followed by two quickly moving infantry corps, marched from Farmville in central Virginia, arriving at Appomattox Station before Lee and blocking his route on April 8th. The next morning, Lee encountered Union cavalry and infantry in front of him, as well as two Union corps in the rear. Confederate General John B. Gordon's army attacked Federal cavalry, but Gordon realized that he couldn't do anything without major help from other Confederate forces. When Lee heard this news and realized his retreat had been halted, he requested a meeting with Grant to arrange the surrender of his army. He later asked for a suspension of hostilities until the conclusion of the surrender talks. Grant requested that Confederate soldiers, except for officers, lay down their guns and return home after signing paroles. Lee agreed to the conditions, so Grant began writing them down. One concern that Lee raised before the terms were finalized and signed was the topic of horses. He mentioned that unlike the Federals, Confederate cavalry and artillerymen in his army used their own horses. Grant responded that he would not include it in the deal, but would allow the soldiers to take their animals home. Lee also brought up the topic of rations, as his soldiers had been without them for several days. Grant agreed to provide 25,000 meals to the hungry Confederate men. While it was the most important surrender of the Civil War, General Robert E. Lee only surrendered his Army of Northern Virginia to Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Mary Custis Lee claimed in a statement about her husband that General Lee is not the Confederacy. Her assessment was accurate since the Confederacy remained alive. General Joseph E. Johnston's army, the second largest after Lee's, was still at war in North Carolina. Lieutenant General Richard Taylor was in charge of forces in Alabama, Mississippi, and parts of Louisiana. Lieutenant General Edmund Kirby Smith's forces were west of the Mississippi, and Brigadier General Stan Watty led an Indian unit in the far west. Nathan Bedford Forrest's soldiers were spread across Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Joseph Johnston and his troops received news of Lee's surrender on April 12th in North Carolina. Following the Battle of Bentonville, Johnston's Confederate Army dropped to roughly 30,000 troops. This made up about half of Sherman's Union command. Several days later, Major General John Schofield's Union force joined Sherman at Goldsboro, bringing the total Union force to almost 80,000 soldiers. With Grant no longer battling Lee in Virginia, the two Union forces, Grant and Sherman, could concentrate their attacks on Johnston and destroy his lone Confederate army. The next day, General William Sherman's Union cavalry took rally, forcing Johnston's soldiers westward. Under relentless pressure from Sherman, Johnston sought to negotiate peace conditions. 
after newly inaugurated President Johnson and his cabinet rejected an original agreement that provided significant political concessions to the South. Confederate President Jefferson Davis directed Johnston to resume battle. Johnston resisted, knowing he had his back to the wall. On April 26, Sherman and Johnston signed a new surrender deal similar to Grant and Lee's at Appomattox. Sherman informed Johnston that, I will accept the same terms as General Grant gave General Lee and be careful not to complicate any points of civil policy. In the Civil War's largest surrender, Johnston gave up over 90,000 soldiers in total, virtually all surviving Confederate troops in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. When the news of Johnston's surrender reached Alabama, the next dominoes began to fall. Lieutenant General Richard Taylor, son of former U.S. President Zachary Taylor, led around 10,000 men in the Confederate Department of Alabama, Mississippi, and East Louisiana. Mobile, Alabama, surrendered to Union soldiers in mid-April, following Union successes at two forts that protected the city. This, in addition to the news of Johnston's surrender negotiations with Sherman, prompted Taylor to request a talk with his Union counterpart, Major General Edward Canby. On May 2nd, the two commanders met a few miles north of Mobile. After agreeing to a 48-hour truce, the generals had an outside picnic with food, drink, and loud music. Canby offered Taylor the identical terms that Lee and Grant had agreed upon. Taylor accepted the terms and resigned his command on May 4th in Citronelle, Alabama. A few days later, in Gainesville, Alabama, Nathan Bedford Forrest surrendered his cavalry corps, announcing to his soldiers, We are beaten is a self-evident fact, and any further resistance on our part would justly be regarded as the very height of folly and rashness. On May 10th, Union forces finally captured Confederate President Jefferson Davis at Irwinville, Georgia. Nevertheless, the South was not finished. Even after those surrenders, after Union soldiers caught fleeing Davis in Georgia, and President Johnson stated on May 10th that the South's military resistance may be regarded as virtually at an end. Fighting raged west of the Mississippi River. On May 12th, near Brownsville, Texas, 350 Confederates led by Colonel John Rip Ford assaulted 800 Union troops led by Colonel Theodore H. Barrett at the Battle of Palmito Ranch, the Civil War's final land battle. It was mainly Texans versus Texans. It wasn't really that big of a fight, but it's still the last significant conflict of the Civil War. By then, Lieutenant General Edmund Kirby Smith's Army of the Trans-Mississippi, the last significant Confederate force in the field, had begun to collapse. When word spread about Appomattox, there was a massive exodus from the army. Smith has been described as basically a general just in name because he has no army. On May 26th, Smith resigned his command in Galveston. Brig General Stan Watty, the first Native American to serve as a Confederate general, kept his forces on the field for over a month after Smith surrendered the Trans-Mississippi Army. On June 23rd, Watty eventually admitted defeat and surrendered his Confederate Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, and Osage men at Dokesville near Fort Towson, becoming the last Confederate general to give up command. The CSS Shenandoah, a former British trading ship, reconfigured as a Confederate raider in 1864, continued to terrorize Union commercial ships in the Bering Sea long after the fighting on land had finished. The ship was under orders to pillage New England's whaling fleets, therefore the Shenandoah targeted Yankee whalers. Because the ship's crew was still uninformed that the war had finished, the Shenandoah set to work harassing Union ships in the Bering Sea and Arctic Ocean. By August 1865, the Shenandoah had seized or sank 38 ships, including whalers and trade vessels. Only in August 1865, when its captain, Lieutenant Come Dr. James Waddle, received confirmation that the war had officially ended, ships stow its guns and make an undercover escape to Liverpool, England, where it furled its huge Confederate flag for the last time. On April 2nd, 1866, President Johnson issued a proclamation declaring that the revolt had ended in all but one 
of the former Confederate states. Texas, which had yet to establish its own state government, because the conflict had had significantly less effect on Texas's economy, land, and infrastructure than on the rest of the South, many former Confederates from other states came there in the months following the war. These waves of newly arrived white Southerners would conflict with another expanding demographic in the state, former slaves. In June, when President Johnson recognized Texas's new constitution, which guaranteed limited civil rights to black people, statewide elections were held. On August 9th, conservative unionist James Webb Throckmorton took office as governor. On August 20th, 1866, in recognition of Texas's new state government, Johnson was able to finally pronounce that, said insurrection is at an end, and that peace, order, tranquility, and civil authority now exist in and throughout the whole United States of America. This was the official end of the Civil War. Thanks for watching, subscribe, and press likes.